The next day, the news that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem swept through the massive crowd gathered for the feast. So they took palm branches and went out to meet him. Everyone was shouting, Lord, be our Savior, or Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes to, to us sent from Yahweh, the King of Israel. Then Jesus found a young donkey and rode it, rode on it to fulfill what was prophesied. In the, this is in the book of Zechariah. People of Zion, have no fear. Look, your king is coming to you riding on a donkey. Now Jesus' disciples didn't fully understand the importance of what was taking place. But after he was raised and exalted into glory, they understood how Jesus fulfilled all the prophecies in the scriptures that were written about him. Isn't that powerful? One of the things I want to talk about is the passion of their worship. And I want to talk to you just a little bit about passion for a moment. Um, I don't know about you, but I could feel a passion stirring in worship today. And there's some beautiful imagery of the palm branches. Some of the Old Testament feasts, they would actually take different types of palm branches and they would tie them together and they represented different things. But what the priest would do in one of the Old Testament feasts is they would take the palm branches. It wasn't this feast, though. It was another time during the year. But they would, they would take the, the palm branches and they would declare from the north, from the south, from the east to the west, the dominion of heaven. And it was a proclamation of God's kingdom reigning in the earth. And what's beautiful about this is the, the, the praise and worship of, these, uh, of the people that were receiving Jesus were literally uh, proclaiming the dominion of King Jesus in that moment. But there's something about the passion of their worship, and there's something about passion in general that I, I feel led to, to speak about today. And we're going to be looking at um, just quickly three things that Jesus was passionate about. I don't know about you, but I'm passionate about a lot of different things, and some of them more than others. And how many know it's important to discover what you're passionate about? Right. Sometimes it will help us discover what we're designed for. Um, in fact, sometimes we'll do things that we're good at, but we hate and we're not designed to do them. If we do things that we're passionate about, they'll make us come fully alive. Sometimes we literally have to sacrifice things that we're good at to do what we're designed for so we can do what we're great at. And and discovering what you're passionate about is a clear indicator of what you're created for. It's almost like God's fingerprint on your life. And, and so what is it that makes you come fully alive? And, and we're going to talk about this. I, I don't know about you, but I'm passionate. And this is, I'm kind of joking. And of course, this is, I mean, you know, people take wagers in the back, like how soon until Pastor Jack talks about food in his sermon. Um, and uh, pretty much the odds are in favor of me. Yes, I will mention food at some point. Not every Sunday, but a lot of Sundays. I like food. I'm passionate about food. <laughs> I remember some lady one time, I was enjoying this Thai food, and this lady's like, you know, I just, I'm watching how you are enjoying your food. At first, I'm thinking, like, don't call me fat, bro. Like, seriously, don't, you know. Um, and I'm eating and enjoying myself. And and she goes, you know, it's a sign of intelligence when people enjoy their food. I'm like, amen. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> the other day, we were uh, eating uh, at our house, and we had some people over for dinner. And, and Tom was over, and Tad was over, and we had some music going. And we're just cooking in the kitchen and just hanging out. Man, you remember that? And the ladies are at the table gossiping. I mean, talking about Jesus and... <laughs> And there's something about just coming together around a table. I'm passionate about that. I do enjoy the taste of food. I enjoy how it nourishes us. Sometimes I'll eat Thai food that's too spicy and I pay the price later. It's called the ring of fire. Don't think about it too much. But, like, I love food. Uh, and, and I love, there's a lot of things I love. I, you know, I love uh, not going to Disneyland. Praise God. Amen. I'll, I'll just skip right through that one. Um, I'm passionate about justice. Like, there's something the way God made me where, like, I don't like lies. I don't like, like, my kids can tell you, when they're little and they lied, they were in big trouble. Like, David could punch the neighbor kid, and I'd be like, good job, buddy. But if he lied to me, 
he's getting a whooping. Of course, I'm exaggerating. He would not punch the neighbor kid unless the neighbor kid called his sister a name. That'd be different, right? But I'm passionate about justice. Like, I want, I want truth to prevail. Like, when I see somebody oppressed that, that shouldn't be oppressed, oh, man, like, I, I, like, no. There's an emphatic no inside of me where I want to see righteousness prevail and truth come forth in a situation. I'm passionate about my family. As you know, I talk about my kids all the time, and I can't help to talk about my kids. I love my kids. I'm a father. It's who I am. And, and my love for my wife and my kids are an expression of the love that God gave me. And, and the same thing with you, like you're a business owner, or whether you, you, know, you have a, a marriage, or your friends, the family of God around you, the way you relate to one another, the way you love, that is an expression of the love of God in us. Like, there are some of you here that own businesses, and you're, it's like God's given you the heart of a pastor. I think about Tom. Like, you, you don't realize maybe, but there's a heart of God in you that's like a pastor. And you create an environment for your employees where they can come together, and you take good care of them. That's what a shepherd does. And so coming alive in what we're created for will help us walk in our passions uh, when we recognize what they are. I'm passionate about my wife and my kids, though. I, I, I love bragging about my kids, and you can't stop me. And the father's the same way. You know, he loves bragging about you. My spiritual father always says, if God had a refrigerator, your name would, your picture would be on it. Your picture would be on it. And you're his favorite. Each and every one of you. I don't know how he does it, but he can do it. I tell my kids that. I'm like, you're my favorite. I'll whisper to Layla, Layla, you're my favorite. Don't tell the other kids. And then she'll tell me, Daddy, you're my favorite. Don't tell the other kids. <laughs> she actually uh, is in dance competition right now. Um, I had to pay my wife money to be here at church. She loves the Lord, but she wanted to be there. But she's here. My, my, I'm just kidding. I didn't really have to. Well, maybe I do. I don't know. Do I owe you money for this? Okay. But my daughter, listen to this, man. I got to brag on my daughter. She did a competition the other day out of like 60-plus girls she won first place for her solo. First place overall. Come on. She's brilliant. She's so good. And, and it's not just something she's good at. She's actually passionate about it. It makes her come fully alive. So fully alive that she runs around and does aerials and all kinds of things all around the house. If I hear boom, 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 boom. I know it's not the boys wrestling, although Josiah wrestles. But I, it's Layla doing aerials in the living room. But she won first place overall. What a proud dad moment, right? And my mom, or my mom, my wife's crying. And uh, sometimes I feel like you're my mom. Praise God. <laughs> when you tell me what to do, uh, everything. I, uh, I'm kidding. That's a bad moment where I get distracted. <laughs> but she won first place for her, uh, for the, her category and overall. It was amazing. And some of you had heard, I, I actually uh, bragged on this already, so did my wife. My, my Josiah uh, won first place in uh, JV Monroe County for wrestling. And there's only been three that Churchville have won. Three out of, out of all the years that Churchville's wrestling in JV in Monroe County. And my son got to win. He won his first year wrestling. Like, listen, I'm telling you. And, and what's cool about it is as a father, I'm behind my kid's passion. But here's what it is. With the Lord, not only is he behind your passion, he actually put it in you. Yeah. 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 Amen. Philippians 2.13 says, God, he gives you the will and the passion to do what pleases him. He gives you the passion to do what pleases him. That's amazing. Like, there are so many things I'm passionate about. Um, you know, I'm passionate about my marriage. Like, it's so important as fathers or, or as husbands to, to make sure that you cultivate your oneness with your bride. And, and I'm so passionate about seeing my family whole and, and sitting at a table and uh, us coming all together. You know, my son wrestling, I, I do have to say, though, believe it or not, I used to wrestle in high school. Why was there no, no one like said, yeah, I could tell. <laughs> Believe it or not, I actually used to run like 20 miles a week. I know you're shocked. <laughs> I know you're greatly shocked. Um, I, I, I do have to tell this joke, though. Have you ever, do your clothes talk to you? Does anyone here have their clothes? I opened the drawer the other day, and my swimsuit was like, get a, get a gym membership. Like, they literally, 
my swimsuit told me to get a gym membership. I was so offended. My swimsuit, and then I had another swimsuit. It's like, lose weight. Like, what in the world? So I opened up another drawer. My sweats looked at me. You look good, boy. Come on, somebody. <laughs> oh, oh. But what do you, it's funny, though, because I used to run 20 miles a week. Now I walk up like four stairs. I'm out of breath. <laughs> oh, God. But what do you breathe for? Like, what makes you come fully alive? What are you alive for? What makes you, like, do what you want to do and do it great and do it not just good, but come fully alive and do it better? I've learned that passion is not just fuel. It's not just those things. It's not the end game, but it's about the struggle. Because when you're struggling, if you're created for it, you keep doing it. You're faithful. And the reason I'm bringing these things up is because we are now stepping into what we call Passion Week. Well, we're stepping into what we call Holy Week. This is Palm Sunday, also known as Passion Sunday, where we are looking at the life of Jesus and, and his suffering and what he was willing to suffer and give his life for if you think about the, even the definition of passion, it's the sufferings of Jesus between the night, the last supper, and his death. It also means a strong liking or desire or devotion for some activity. You can only know what you're passionate about by what you're willing to sacrifice or suffer for. So this isn't just Palm Sunday. It's the beginning of a holy week. This is the one week. If you could think about moments in your life I'm going to step in. I'm going to quickly talk about three things that Jesus was passionate about. But if you think about moments in your life where, like, that's what I was born for. If we look at this week, this is what Jesus, this was the week that Jesus came to display his love. He came to give everything for you and I because he was passionate about us. I want to jump to a verse in John 13, verse 1. This verse, I always go back to it. I always, it's like eating at a buffet. You go to the word of God and there's certain places you like. There's certain foods you like. And to me, this verse is a juicy steak of spiritual food. And I keep going back and feasting on it. And it continues to nourish me. How many know when you read the Bible, it will continue to nourish you? And I would encourage you to have a high value for the scripture so as we read this, let's come with humble hearts, reflecting on the passion, the love, what Jesus was willing to lay everything down for, which is you and I. Jesus knew, John 13, 1, that the night before Passover would be his last night on earth before leaving this world. Can you imagine? Like if somebody knew this is the last dinner they're going to have with you. The last night on earth. And Jesus, it says, all throughout his time with his disciples, Jesus had demonstrated a deep and tender love for them. Wow. And now, this, this part gets me every time. And now he longed to show them the full measure of his love. right before he washes the disciples' feet in this holy room, the sacred moment where he shows his condescending love. Quickly, let's go through. Number one, Jesus was passionate to pursue us. I want to read you something on the humility of God. Jesus became human, God incarnate. This is uh, the orthodox understanding that he was, Jesus was fully God and fully human. And there's a, uh, something about the humility of God that somebody wrote, and I want to read this. Christ's humility was viewed by the original orthodox Christians not as a moral weakness, but a moral strength. God's humility is not an expression of fault or an adequacy, but a manifestation of perfection. That is, because God is perfect love, he is humble. God does not cease being humble after the resurrection, as if humility has no eternal reality. 
as if it were merely a created, utilitarian, temporary quality needed to save men. Rather, God never ceases to be humble because he loves, nurtures, and sustains us without end. And this is one of the reasons the original Christians believed that Jesus' glorified human body, this is profound, retained its wounds after the resurrection. Just as Thomas saw, because they are an everlasting visual reminder of his condescending humility. So when we think about Palm Sunday, him lowly riding on a donkey, the way the king entered this triumphal entry was not like another king coming on a war horse. He was coming with humble love to transform hearts and lives that would eventually transform the entire world. He goes on, and this is uh, James Bernstein, who's actually one of the founders of Jews for Jesus, who is now an Orthodox priest. He says that the Christian God is a God of love, who is love and manifests his love in humility. It has implications for us that are staggering. This means, to begin with, that because God loves, we should love. Amen? Amen. Because God is humble, we should be humble. It also means that God unconditionally loves all, the just and the unjust, now and forever, because it is only in God's nature to love, not to hate. God pursued us in condescending humility. It was the ultimate undercover boss episode. Jesus was God incarnate, and he chose to take the lowest place of a servant and wash his disciples' feet. Why did, why did he pursue us? Because the Father, and, and the, the love of the Father, the, the burning love of the Father to want to redeem us. I remember this scary profound moment that I reflect on every once in a while where we're walking around this place in Las Vegas. It was like an amusement park and we're walking around and we realized Josiah was missing. And we're like, where did Josiah go? And it was probably two minutes. It was the longest two minutes of my life. And the pursuit and the love and the fierceness in my heart and in my wife's heart to pursue our son that we love in that moment, was unfathomable. I cannot even tell you. Just the thought of, where, like, did we lose him? Did somebody take him? Like, we're, obviously, we don't want to think the worst, but we're trying to be aware of the situation and resolve it as quickly as possible. And I remember telling David and Sarah, and I'm like, you guys, go look here, go look there, all the big kids, and, and, and the other littles, like, stay close to us. And, and then we, after about two minutes, thank God we found him. Obviously, we found him because he's here. He's doing camera today. Um, <laughs> amen. He just won wrestling. I told you the story. He's here. Okay, that's spoiler alert. But um, we found him, and he was over by the swords. <laughs> like playing with the swords in one of the stores. I'm like, that's what Josiah would be doing. But the fierceness of our pursuit could hardly compare to the pursuit the Father has for you and I. And we see it in John 13 where Jesus was washing the disciples' feet. Can you imagine how holy this moment was? Jesus was so passionate about pursuing us and humbling himself. The other thing he was passionate about was he was passionate about suffering for us to show, as John 13 1 says, the full measure of his love. Listen, this Friday, we're having a Good Friday service. Come, it's worship and communion and reflection on the cross. It's reflection on what Jesus went through. And as we Step into this week. Obviously, Palm Sunday is beautiful. It's about worship, but it's also Passion Sunday. It's also where the Lord is moving into this week, displaying his love, and he was willing. Are you thankful that he was willing to go to the cross? He was willing to endure hostility from sinners, the scripture says. He was willing to go through the pain, the lashes, the, the crown of thorns, which in one sense was the king of kings coronation. God allowed his creation, his people, to mock him, spit on him, whip him, and crucify him. Jesus was God incarnate and submitted himself to the hands of sinners. 
There's a famous sermon that I hate. It's called God in the Hands of Angry Sinners. Wait, I'm sorry. It's called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. The first one actually is what it should have been called because it depicts the story of the crucifixion. It was God in the hands of angry sinners. So we have this idea that we are sinners in the hands of an angry God. Well, we are sinners, but listen, God is not mad at you. He's fiercely in love with you. The things that he hates are the things that destroy us. The things that he's mad at, his anger is towards sin, not his sons and daughters. And I think one of John Edwards did the sermon. My kids had to write things on it because their school, their Christian school had some Baptist roots. And I remember telling my kids, I'm like, that's the worst sermon ever preached by Jonathan Edwards. Worst sermon. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. If you read it, to me, it's sickening and it depicts a pagan God. It doesn't depict the God revealed in Jesus. It wasn't us in the hands of an angry God. It was God in the hands of angry sinners. And he submitted himself to that. Jesus was passionate. He, he, every breath that he lived was for this moment, for this day, for this week of suffering to go and show the full measure of his love. T.F. Torrance said this. This is so powerful. In Jesus Christ, the Son of, in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, penetrated into the dark depths of our alienated, enslaved, and distorted human existence making it his own in order to heal, sanctify, renew it in himself throughout the whole course of his vicarious human life, his death, his resurrection, and thus restore us to a perfect, loving union with God the Father. In this suffering he went through for you and I, he was passionate about it. I remember this moment in Las Vegas where we're, being a pastor is not easy in so many ways. I could tell you, you know, if it, I've said this before, sometimes I don't know if I should say it, but I'll say it anyways. If this wasn't a calling, I don't know if it would be a career. <laughs> in other words, it wouldn't be what I do like full time. Um, I love people, but pastoring, especially being a senior pastor, there's a different pressure that you feel. And, and it's hard you know, pastors lose close friends, pastors, like, it's like, I, I could just go on. I'm not going to victimize and tell you, like, hurtful stories, but pastoring is not easy. And one of the hardest things is when you have people and families you love and, and someone loses a loved one. Like, death is, is really tough. Or, or when you visit somebody in the hospital and they're not doing well, and, and I, I've prayed for people in the hospital that were given many death sentences by doctors and they walked out. I've seen the dead raised, but I've also prayed for people and they died. Uh, I remember this one time we go to a hospital and this precious, I, I was reminded of this. I saw a video that Josiah took during worship when he was little and he's, he's on one of our phones and, uh, and I can hear worship going on. And in the background is uh, this couple that were at the Vegas church and um, the, the wife was suffering and she got diagnosed with cancer. Just, it was just like out of nowhere. And we go to the hospital to pray for her and we're believing God for, for life, right? Always. And this woman was so powerful. She was from the Philippines. And we're in there and we're singing, how great is our God? And we're praying for healing. And she's coughing up blood and singing with us. And the suffering she went through in this moment was it was really traumatic for me. And I'm like, God, we really want to see breakthrough here. You know, I'm reminded of the story I told last week. It's like, he's able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we still won't bow. And I don't think it was like God didn't choose to heal. I think we're learning to release healing. I don't think it's like he dishes out healing to some and doesn't to others. I think his nature, disposition is healing, wholeness. Death is not a part of his plan. And maybe that doesn't fit in your theological paradigm, but you can just process that. We can talk about it later. But in this moment, I'm like, we're worshiping, we're praying for healing. It was the epitome of suffering. Not as bad as what Jesus went through, but it sucked, man. And I remember, she's like coughing up blood. My wife was there. And I'll just never forget the nearness of the presence of Jesus was you, I couldn't, it's unfathomable. I can't even explain to you how present Jesus was. And in his suffering 
on the cross and everything that he went through, God was so close in that moment. And when we go through hard times, he's near to the brokenhearted. He was passionate and willing. This is what he came to do, was to give himself for you and I. And I'm reminded of that moment where praying, um, this uh, sister went on to be with the Lord, and, uh, and her husband is still a leader at our church in Las Vegas. But I remember that moment, and what I learned is that he's closer to us than we can realize in times of brokenness. Lastly, Jesus was passionate to reveal to us that we have a loving Abba. You know, when he was on the cross and he said, Father, forgive them, and they don't know what they're doing, he wasn't asking God to do something that he didn't want to do. He was revealing to people the heart of the Father of what was actually happening in the moment. How do I know that? Well, the Bible says, Paul said this, 2 Corinthians 5, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. See, the love of God and the Father's love was revealed profoundly at the cross because God is love. This is, we see the self-giving, sacrificial, other-centered love of God revealed in the suffering of Jesus. He was passionate to suffer, but he was passionate to reveal to us a loving Father. So when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, he wasn't asking the Father to do something that he may or may not want to do but he was rather revealing a heart of radical forgiveness to all of humanity. Psalm 22, I want to read actually uh, in in closing. This is a very powerful psalm that is the suffering, praise, and posterity of the Messiah. Now this is one of the cries that Jesus cried out on the cross, and it's probably one of the most misunderstood cries where he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I do believe that in that moment, Jesus in his humanity felt what it felt like to to not have the presence of God, like to feel like God was not present. But that doesn't mean that God forsook him because in his divinity, Jesus, being one person, was both had two natures, fully divine, fully human. Not 50-50, but fully human, fully divine. So in his humanity, he may have felt like he was forsaken, but you can't separate the Trinity. And one of the reasons, and I'll just encourage you, you can search that out on your own. The ancient church never believed that the Father actually forsook Jesus. I've, I've heard people say... And I'll challenge it. I don't believe it. I've heard people say, well, he forsook him so that we won't be forsaken. No. It's not in God's nature to forsake. Even his own son. Even the idea that, well, he looked away because God can't look upon sin. It comes from one verse in the Old Testament where the prophet is saying, why do you behold this? Like, you cannot look upon sin, then why are you beholding it? It's so silly because if you read the next verse, the prophet is saying, you're actually watching this happen. That's the language. It's not that God is not able to look at evil or sinfulness. He sees it all. Hello? If God can't look upon sin, then you're denying that Jesus is God because he sat across the table from sinners. He looked at the woman caught in adultery, looked right at her. God can't look upon sin. Oh, he can look on sin. So we have these misnomers in Scripture. So when Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He wasn't, he he was actually quoting Psalm 22 in the first century when somebody would say the beginning of a psalm, it would be like you and I today saying Psalm 22 or Psalm 23. As a matter of fact, if we say the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Immediately you resonate with that. You hear that read at funerals. It's like, well, I know that psalm. How many know that psalm? And what is that psalm about? It's about the love, the comfort, and the provision of God as a shepherd. So when Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was actually declaring himself to be the Messiah. 
And if you read Psalm 22, it doesn't end with God left him. It actually changes. And so I, I just got to read a couple verses here. Psalm 22. I don't mean to be controversial. I just want to give you the truth because the truth will set you free. Because if you think the father will forsake Jesus, then he's probably going to forsake you. I mean, there's, even though he did it for us, it's like in our minds, there's still something entrenched in our mental understanding of who God is, where it's like, ah, he's a good father, but there's, there's that but in there, but there is, there is no if there. There's no, it's like what Jesus revealed, that's who God is. There's no God hiding behind Jesus. And, and I have news for you. Jesus did not come to save you from an angry father. He came to magnify the fiery love of an Abba that saw a broken humanity and said, I will go as far and as long and what I'll do whatever it takes to rescue this broken humanity. That's the gospel, church. I don't mean to be controversial, but I, I, I've got to tell you the truth. So Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from my words, my groaning? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the silent season, I am not silent. Have you ever felt like God is silent? Have you ever felt like he wasn't around? It's horrible, right? But it's not reality. Verse three, but you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. There's something about the posture of worship. You know, the same people that were saying Hosanna shouted crucify him. So we gotta be careful that our passion for worship doesn't change. Like, are we faithful? And worship on the mountaintop is easy, but worship in the valley is a sacrifice. So the psalmist is like, I don't feel you, and I don't see you, but you're holy, and you're enthroned on the praises of your people. In other words, when I, I'll still worship, and when I worship, it's an entrance to your dominion in the earth. That's what Palm Sunday is about. The passion entering Holy Week. But let me just jump to a verse. You read Psalm 22 later. Okay, that's your homework because I want to let you go in just a minute. Verse 24. This whole Psalm is about Jesus. And in tw verse 24, oh man. <laughs> Actually, verse 23. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All you offspring of Israel. Verse 24, for he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Nor has he hidden his face from him, but when he cried to him, he heard. When Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's saying, the Lord, the Father's going to vindicate me. Read the whole psalm. Don't just cherry pick one verse and take it out of context and take some bad theology and mix it in and form your own image of God. God doesn't do forsaken. God doesn't do abandonment. God isn't like dads that leave us. Jesus came to reveal the heart of Abba. This is the last point. He came to reveal the heart of the Father. Sometimes it's hard to receive from fathers because we never heard a dad say, I'm proud of you. Sometimes it's easy to re receive from mothers because we had nurturing love, but we need both. We need nurturing love and we need the love of the father to help shape our identity. And I'm telling you right now, the father is looking at his kids right now on Palm Sunday, on Passion Sunday, and he's saying, I'm so proud of you. Max, I can hear the father so loudly. I am so proud of you. Justin, I can hear him say it over your life. You're my beloved son in whom my soul delights. I can hear him saying it over you, Wayne. I can hear him saying it over his daughter, Sarah. <laughs> Not just because you're my daughter. I can hear him saying, you're daddy's girl. Can you feel the love of the father? I can hear him saying it over my wife. I support you. I'm behind you. I'm with you. I can hear him saying it over all y'all. Tiffany, the Father's love. Whew. That's what Jesus came to reveal. And the scripture says here, 
he didn't hide his face from him, but he heard when he cried. And it goes on to say, my praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forevermore. The end of John 13, he washes the disciples' feet and Judas betrays Jesus. Jesus, John leans in. He's like, which one is going to betray you? And Jesus is like, the one who double dips. Y'all know when you're at a party, watch the guy that double dips. It's in the Bible. Jesus was betrayed and forsaken. You think you're broken when you feel forsaken? I, I, I remember reading this thing, like most people lose a few significant friends in their lifetime. Pastors lose about three a year. And I'm telling you, it's true. It's like all of a sudden, nobody they don't want to be your friend. They want to be everyone else's friend. It hurts, but what the Lord went through is nothing. I mean, what I went through is nothing compared to what the Lord went through. They all left. Judas leaves, and then here's what the Lord said. Let me I, I'm gonna close with John 13, two verses, okay? And I and this is this is what I'm I, I'm praying that we would, would just capture God's heart for us. You know, the Bible says God is for us, but sometimes we're not for us. And we quote that verse, God is for me. Well, how about you be for you too? Even when no one else is for you. If God's for you, then you got to be for you too. But that we would capture his heart and that we, on Palm Sunday, would capture the passion of Jesus and love like him. And that's my charge, my encouragement. John 13, 33 and 34. After Judas walked out the door, Jesus didn't start a prayer meeting that turned into a gossip session. We love doing that, right? He didn't, you know what he did? He said, guess what, y'all? They're gonna know you're my disciples by the love you have for one another. Love anyways. Love fiercely. Speak life anyways even when you're betrayed, even when you're hurt and broken. That's what today is about in entering the Holy Week. We observe, we look, we we like behold the beauty of what Jesus came to do and we receive his love and his life and it transforms us. Verse 33, little children, I'll be with you a little while longer, but when you seek me, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give you that you love one another as I've loved you, that you also love one another. By this, you will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus showed the full measure of his love. His love. He always displayed love everywhere he went. I don't know about you, but I want to do the same. And in order for me to do the same, I got to receive his love. Amen. Will you stand up with me? And I want to...